What is the magic behind sneaking your way into a new position so seamlessly that we don't hear any traditional slides? And actually, I'm talking about ways to get into new positions, in which case you don't actually perform a standard shift. You know, usually when we learn how to shift and when we learn about all the different positions, we learn how to go from one position to the next, as I demonstrated in previous videos, by listening to different intervals and uh, by using the forearm to change the position and really maintain this frame. But what if I told you there are other ways we can get into new positions? And actually, what I'm talking about is something that's much more advanced. So first, you do have to master uh, traditional shifts, um, understand how the hand frame works, and also, of course, always continuously train your ear. So I do recommend you watch those videos first, which I'm going to link down below if you want to practice those first. Hey, this is Ina Langerman from Violina.live, helping you along your musical journey. In this video, we are going to start exploring the concept of delayed shifts, which can be a form of either extension or contraction of the fingers, after which the hand frame snaps back into place in the new position. So why would one do this kind of shift? Why not just do traditional shift? Well, for one thing, it can make melodic lines a lot more lyrical and a lot more legato in certain cases. Second thing is that it can help make certain passages easier to play and it's actually a technique that can help improve your dexterity and speed and also fluidity of the left hand. We are going to look at five different examples from the standard repertory, three snippets from orchestra excerpts and two really short snippets from concertos. Very often these occur when we have to leave our hand frame within a passage. Usually that means either doing chromatic passages or something that involves tritones or augmented triads. So a lot of the passages that we're going to look at today involve extensions, actually, and uh, how we can use them to create either a more legato line or get into any position much easier. The first example is going to be the very opening of Prokofiev Violin Concerto Number no. 2 in G minor, just the very, very opening. We are going to look at the very first phrase, uh, which is kind of very mysterious and legato. You don't want to phrase it too much. You don't want to have too many peaks and valleys there, um, at least that's how I interpret it. But we still want to phrase it and uh, make it as smooth as possible. <laughs> There are two ways to perform going from G to D. One way is you can shift traditionally, but you can hear the slide. And to me, that almost ruins the idea, the atmosphere that I want to create. So I decided to extend up. Now, perfect fifth extensions going up, not easy, especially for uh, especially if your pinky is short. So the best way to do it is to extend your thumb first while you're playing the note G, and then you can reach the D, and then when it resolves down to C, then the hand has moved one position up. The second example we're going to look at is the opening of Brahms' Second Symphony. Here is a great example of why we need to be practicing fingered octaves. You know, sometimes I used to ask myself a long time ago, why should I practice fingered octaves? I'm not somebody who wants to become, you know, uh, some kind of virtuoso playing Paganini caprices all the time. Yeah, I had some Paganini caprices in my repertoire, but I wasn't really crazy about playing solo. I'm more of an ensemble player. Um, so to speak. So I used to wonder why do I need to practice these? They are almost never, they almost never occur in this kind of repertoire. But you know what? Practicing extensions and fingered octaves and tents helped help me so much with excerpts like the opening to the Brahms 2. This is another example of 
where we need to create a very smooth legato line, which is extremely difficult to do. Brahms puts a huge slur over this phrase, and in uh, many orchestras, they will actually stagger the bow changes to uh, make it sound as seamless as possible. So I used to practice this excerpt a lot, and I would always struggle to make it sound really legato. You know, I would work on my bow technique a lot, which I continue to do so every day, but it would just never sound quite right. There was just something that didn't make sense. So I tried many different fingering options, and then I realized there are moments in this excerpt where I can sneak down from one position to another. I use fingered octaves to change positions. So from this part, instead of playing the lower E on with the first finger, this is where I reach down with the second finger. Then, once I get to that note, you see my forearm moves and adjusts for the major six. And then I repeat the pattern, but this time with one and three fingered octave. Again, forearm is going to catch up. So the forearm goes later, after I have extended. It happens several more times in this passage. Uh, there's only one real shift that I do on the D string, and it's fine, I'm okay with that. But changing my fingering to this has really helped me. The third example is very similar to the Brahms, actually. And this is where we are going to see a common trend. Actually, in the next two examples, we're going to see a common trend where extensions and uh, sneaking your way into a new position through extensions is very common when you have diminished passages. So the first one is in the third movement of the Sibelius Concerto. So Sibelius is not officially in my repertoire. I never actually performed it. I briefly studied it on my own. So in the middle of the third movement, where the key signature switches back to two sharps, there is a whole page filled with diminished passages and also mixed with chromatism. So chromatic and diminished, those are the two very common places where we can use this kind of technique. And there are two places where we have a descending figure. It's a sequence and the finger pattern repeats itself. So when you have this kind of finger pattern, you can reach down and then catch up with the forearm. And it's more difficult to catch the interval in this case, especially in the second one, because when we shift downward, we need to hear, on the second instance, we need to hear a perfect fifth. But it's a little unusual to listen for the perfect fifth because this is a neighbor tone to the actual diminished chord that we are outlining. The fourth example is a similar idea. A little bit less extreme than the Sibelius, but it's from the Schumann Scherzo orchestra excerpt from the second movement from his second symphony, very famous excerpt in many auditions. We are just going to zoom in right to letter K, to that first measure we have a descending diminished chord. Because it's a diminished chord, it's made up of tritones, which means we can go to third position. And then once we've gotten to third position for a third note, we can do the opposite. We can do a contraction of the fingers. Use the fourth finger to play the F sharp on the A string. Then you can use the second finger, of course, 
keep that first finger down on the E string, on that note A. It's going to keep your uh, fingers organized so that they don't get lost within this passage, within this pattern. So the fourth finger extends downward, then the second finger touches the E flat, so it's actually creating a tritone with the A. And once you get to that E flat, then you can let go of the first finger, and guess what? You're in second position. We've been using extensions downward and contractions with the upper fingers in combination, crawling our way down to first position. Okay, so for example number five, this is definitely not a standard excerpt, but I'm using this example from Dvorak's Eighth Symphony. Uh, in the first movement, there is a big uh, chromatic passage accompanying the brass closer to the end of the first movement. I'm using this example because um, I cannot leave out chromatic passages out of this. This is another method of finding your way into a new position because chromatic scales involve all half steps. And there is one measure in particular, it's the sixth measure of this passage, where technically if you take the first note if you do this fingering, which I came up with. There are so many fingering options for this, by the way, so this is definitely, definitely not the only way to do this. So in the sixth measure of the first note, I play with the fourth finger, I do four, three, two, one, and then, then I reach up to make a half step, and I do the same thing, four, three, two, one. Okay, there is a ton of music out there. I only had time to give you five examples for this video. I hope this gives you some ideas of coming up with fingering choices in your repertoire. Sometimes when you play orchestra music, you'll find some very awkward passages that have many fingering options and it's kind of difficult to figure out which one would be better. So I hope this gave you a few ideas. Um, let me know in the comments below what you're working on right now. And if you got any value from this video, please give me a quick thumbs up down below to help support this channel and so that YouTube can share this video with more people. If you would like a summary of all my content in both video and written form twice a month in your inbox, I do have a bi-monthly newsletter which goes out on the 1st and 15th of each month links down in the description below to sign up. Happy practicing and I will see you next week.